Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. We return to the slave woman. We return to this prophecy that at the end of history there will be slavery. That the greatest, the greatest slavery of all is not the slavery which is behind us, but the slavery which is ahead of us. And we know why that slavery is coming. Because someone wants to impose a universal dictatorship upon the whole world, including Venezuela, including Russia, so that they can rule the world from Jerusalem and then declare, I am the Messiah. We understand that. And we know that there is a political strategy through which they achieve that objective. But we are devoting today to the study of the economic strategy through which they achieve the power to rule the world. And in that economic strategy, we have located riba. And this morning, we looked at riba in the Quran by name. And we found that when Allah spoke of riba in the Quran, he was speaking about lending money on interest. And we have explained why he has prohibited it. If you allow money to be lent on interest, then the rich will remain permanently rich and keep on growing richer. And the poor will be imprisoned in permanent poverty and grow constantly poorer. And if the, the, the one who wants to rule the world can get the rich on his side, then he will use the rich to control the poor, to control the world. So simple, the evil genius at work. In this session, we want to look at a second form of riba. Yes, in the Sunan of Ibn Majah, there is a hadith recorded in which the Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, that riba is of 70 different parts. Adza. The smallest part of riba is equivalent to a man marrying his own mother. That's how bad it is. But we're not talking about the parts of riba. We're talking about the different kinds of riba. The first was money being lent on interest. Now let us introduce you to another form, another kind of riba. Three times in the Quran, Allah has commanded with, with reference first of all to the economy at the time of Shu'ib alayhi salam. The command is وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Do not, do not diminish people's property, the value of people's property. This is haram. In the process of diminishing 
the value of people's property. You consume their wealth in such a way that their loss is your gain. Their loss is your gain. Do not diminish the value of people's property. The Americans have a pretty phrase for it. Don't rip off people. The Prophet said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, if you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods and you buy his goods from him before he could enter the market and when he entered the market he found that he could have gotten a better price in the market that's riba that's riba, said the Prophet ﷺ. You exploited his ignorance of the market price. To extract a gain or a profit for you greater than that to which you were justly entitled. That's the elegant way of describing what the Americans call a rip-off. From this, we conclude that any transaction based on deception which yields a gain, an advantage, a profit greater than that to which one is justly entitled would be riba. So every ripoff is riba. I want to introduce you in this session to the greatest ripoff since Adam alayhi salam set foot on earth. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu once came to the Prophet and offered him some dates. The Prophet looked at the dates. He said, Bilal, these are very high quality dates. Where did you get them? Bilal who said, O Messenger of Allah, I had two kilograms, if you'll allow me to use that measurement, of inferior quality dates. Maybe the two kilograms were worth $25 each, $50. And I exchanged them for this one kilogram of superior quality, which probably was worth $50. So in value, they were equal. I exchanged these two kilograms for this one kilogram. Bilal, said the Prophet, Bilal, this is the essence of riba. Bilal, what you should have done was to sell the two kilograms and use that money to buy the one kilogram. But a direct exchange of dates for dates, which was an unequal exchange, was haram, was riba. Why? Why? A hundred years ago, even a schoolboy could answer that question. Today, not even Darululum Zakaria in Johannesburg could answer that question. Yeah. Not even Darululum Newcastle can answer that question. Why? To find out why an unequal exchange of dates was haram and riba. But an unequal exchange of camels was not. 
that Ali radiallahu ta'ala who exchanged one camel for four or one camel for twenty I think and Umar radiallahu ta'ala exchanged one camel for four but that was not haram and that was not riba but the unequal exchange of dates was riba and why was it riba? in answering that question we are introduced to the subject of what is money in Islam what is money in the Quran what is money in the Sunnah I gave this lecture at Darulum Newcastle in South Africa and the head of the Darulum may Allah have mercy on his soul the venerable the venerable Molana Sima was 80 something years of age he just died recently the old man was sitting there for two hours for the lecture and at the end of the lecture he said to me we have to teach this subject in the Darul Ulum meaning it's not taught it's not taught the Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam he gave a command when a transaction is such that it involves an exchange of gold for gold or silver for silver or wheat for wheat or barley for barley or dates for dates or salt for salt six of them you can't see it but you can hear gold silver wheat barley dates salt it must be equal for equal you cannot have an unequal exchange otherwise it will be riba before we ask the question why would it be riba let us look at these six what is common to all six this is a hadith incidentally which which the world of Islam is very familiar very familiar gold for gold silver for silver etc what is common to all six is that they were all used as money that when gold or silver coins were in scarce supply in the market in Medina they would use dates as money and so from this hadith we get a definition of money in the Sunnah that money was either precious metals gold and silver or commodities of food consumption which were in abundant supply in the market and which had a shelf life so you wouldn't use mangoes as money because your money would be rotting what was common to all of these six is that the value of the money was inside the money the money had intrinsic value what was common to all six is that the value of the money despite fluctuations based on demand and supply the value was always value created by Allah and so we get the definition of money in the Sunnah because dates were used as money if we allowed an unequal exchange of dates then I can lend money on interest I just give you one kilogram 
and you will return to me two kilograms after one year. So you will open the door for the money lender if you allow an unequal exchange of money, the same money being used on both sides. But you could not use animals as money because you know the one, I got a goat as my salary and I was taking the goat home. The goat fell down, died. So when I reached home, I said to my wife, salary died. Salary died. So she said, go tell the boss. So I went to the boss. I said, boss, salary died. He said, but when I gave you salary, salary was alive. Since animals can fall ill, since animals can die, animals could not be used as money. And therefore, you could have an unequal exchange of camels. Now then, this is money in the sunnah. Money with intrinsic value. Money which is either precious metals or commodities of food consumption in abundant supply in the market. And which had a shelf life. Money with value, despite fluctuations based on demand and supply, with value created by Allah. Only He can create wealth out of nothing. He is Badiyus Samawati Wal He creates out of nothing. He is Fatir. He creates from point of origin, fatir. He is khalik. He creates and he fashions. But he is also badir samawati wal alb, who creates ab novo, creates from nothing. Is this money also in the Quran? Yes, it is in Surah Al Tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, is it Tawbah? Or is it, uh, I'm forgetting now. He takes to task the Israelite people. Wamin ahlil kitab. Where's the Hafiz? Where's the Hafiz? Which surah is it? All right, well, you can get it in my book. Wamin ahlil kitab. And amongst them, the Ahlul Kitab. If you entrust him with a kintar, which is a treasure, about, say, 1,200 ounces of gold, enough to buy a house in San Francisco. When you want it back, you addihi ilayk. He returned it to you. وَمِنْهُ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِدِينَارِ لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكِ And amongst them there are those who if you entrust him with one dinar, when you want it back, he won't give it back to you. إِلَّا مَا دُمْتَ عَلَيْهِ قَائِمًا The only way you can get it back is if you stand there demanding it and pounding for it. This is because of the double standards we talked about in the previous session. That we have one code of morality amongst ourselves and we do not have to apply that code of morality with these cockroaches. Al-Ummiyun. <laughs> But they tell a lie against Allah. They do it knowingly. They have changed the word of Allah. I couldn't preach this in New York today. I could have done it five years ago. Sorry, ten years ago. But today I cannot deliver this lecture in New York. They changed the word of Allah. But in this ayah, the word dinar is present. 
And the word dinar in the Quran refers to a gold coin. No one challenges that. And then in Surah to Yusuf, they took him out of the well and they took him to Misr. And when the Quran says Misr, it is not referring to the whole of Egypt. No. Misr at that time was only the eastern delta between the Nile and the Red Sea, where Banu Israel had settled. That's Misr. And they sold him in Misr. They sold him for a few measly dirhams. And a dirham in the Quran is a silver coin. Last night we had the word warik in the masjid. And so in the Quran we have money. And money in the Quran is precious metals. And money in the sunnah is precious metals as well. And when there is a shortage of gold and silver, then you can use commodities. If you are in the Indonesian island of Java, oh, that's a beautiful island. You must visit Java. Rice, hundreds and hundreds of acres, miles and miles and miles of lush green grass, rice. So if you're in Java and you run short of sunna money, gold and silver coins, what would you use as money? Rice, of course. Even though rice is not in this list, it is, it is a commodity of food consumption. It is in abundant supply in the market. It has a shelf life. And if you're in Cuba, you know Fidel Castro doesn't smoke cigars anymore. You know that? Huh? Right. Good. So don't tell me tobacco, eh? If you're in Cuba and you want to bring back sunnah money, you don't have gold and silver, what would you use as money? You would use sugar. Sugar. Hmm? It, it, it's so simple. Now then, so long as we use this money, the money that Allah and His Messenger has ordained that we use, this money functioned successfully as money. What are the functions of money? Number one, money functions as a medium of exchange for buying and selling. Notice, I am teaching this subject so simply there is nothing complicated here. And so when you go back home and you have to teach the subject, please teach it simply and do not make it complicated. It's a simple subject. If you have to Look at the functions of money, you would find that money functions as a medium of exchange for buying and selling. I, I need a haircut. And Aisha said to me, I don't have time to cut your hair, you have to go to the barber this time. Because, you know, I don't have time, so I say, Aisha, come cut for me. So I went to the barber, and he cut my hair, and when he's finished cutting my hair, I offered him my book, Surah al Kaf on the Modern Age. He looked at me, he smiled, he said, Sheikh, I'm not interested in your book. Bah! Bata, Bata has its limitations. And the Lord, who is all wise, would know that. And so I need something called money that I can pay the barber for cutting my hair. And then he can use that money to go and buy 
a kilogram of tomatoes. And so the first function of money is to be a medium of exchange. Gold and silver, wheat and barley function successfully, except that when you're using commodities as money, it will only be microtransactions, not macro. You can't buy a house with gold, or with, with wheat. Microtransactions, temporarily. The second function of money is to be a measure of value. What is the value of a haircut? And what is the value of the book? So long as mankind use real money, it always functions successfully as a measure of value. And so the black African woman, in her own country, incidentally, in her own Africa, who had to work as a domestic servant. Sometimes not one, because six of them in her home. When she works, the black African woman, I know her, because everywhere I went, I used to meet her. When she worked for a whole month, she would get a wage that was a, a just wage on the basis of the measure of the value of her labor. Hmm? And so our money functions successfully, not only as a medium of exchange, but also as a measure of value. Can I get a water, please? Water. Thank you. But money has a third function to perform, and that is to be a store of value. In Surah al -Kaf, when that man dug a hole, remember, and buried his money in the hole, and then he built a wall, and he prayed because maybe he was terminally ill, and he had little children, that is, orphan children, when they grow up and become adults, that they would be able to get the money he had left behind for them. If he left behind a hundred gold coins, and the hundred gold coins could buy a hundred camels, then he would want that his money, twenty years from now, would have stored its value preserved its value so that 20 years later when his children got that money from the hole that money could still buy a hundred camels provided demand and supply being constant our money the money in the Quran the money in the Sunnah perform that function successfully of being a store of value. And this is how the world traded. If you wanted to rip off someone, what you'd have to do is to mix some kind of alloy with the gold or chip the gold used to appoint market police 
and the market police will be moving around in the market and if anyone was caught with money which was not the correct weight or purity right there in the market you would be tried right there in the market you would be sentenced right there in the market you would be punished the state university of new york in a place called binghamton is famous for scholars who have distinguished themselves in the study of the free and the fair market. And they have come to the conclusion that the last free and fair market that the world ever experienced was the market of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. When they strange and mysterious alliance took place between European Jews and European Christians. That strange and mysterious alliance created modern Western civilization, the modern West. And the modern West then proceeded to attack money, to corrupt money, to destroy real money, and to substitute it and replace it with artificial money, bogus, fraudulent money that was totally and utterly haram. If only we could get the muftis of Islam to understand that. They listen to me, but it goes through one ear and it goes on through the other. They've been listening to me for years now, and they're saying, no, Imran is wrong. Imran is wrong. What they did was to, to remove gold and silver from the market and to eventually impose upon mankind a law prohibiting the use of gold as money you probably you probably some of you hearing this for the first time that it is now prohibited by international law to use a gold dinar as money but Allah and his messenger have ordained as money they began the process of corrupting money with the creation of the Bank of England at the end of the 17th century. We cannot today give you the history. It's a very interesting history of the stages through, when, through which they went through, but Dajjal works carefully inch by inch. And he does not want your eyes to open to understand what he is doing. So he eventually gave you television that will put you to sleep. The process commenced with the creation of the Bank of England. And England issuing paper currencies. The paper currency was supposed to be redeemable in gold. Redeemable meaning you could take your paper to the bank and the bank will give you the gold. Redeemable. But you are setting up people to rip them off because you issue more paper than you have gold. And when they realize that and they rush to get back their gold, all fall down. Hmm? And so they are ripped off. And this happened within a few years of the creation of the Bank of England. The process continued after the British ruling state began to transfer power or the transference of power 
was taking place to the second ruling state, the United States. The US dollar is redeemable in gold at 20 US dollars for one ounce of gold. But somewhere around, must have been 1926 or 27, if I'm wrong, correct me, the Federal Reserve was created. Somewhere around there, the Federal Reserve, a private bank, which seeks to impersonate a national bank, a state bank, a private bank. And then suddenly the US government does something strange at the behest of the Federal Reserve. In April of 1931, most Americans don't know this. In April of 1931, the US government declared the use of gold, the, to keep gold coins and gold bullion to be illegal. In other words, they demonetized gold. Gold is no longer legal tender. And if you are caught with gold after a certain date, if you do not hand it over to the government, meaning to the Federal Reserve, who will give you $20 to each gold coin that you give them, one ounce of gold, if you are caught with gold after a certain time, gold coins or gold bullion or gold certificates, you go to jail for six months and pay 10,000 US dollars in fine. That's a lot of money in those days. And so all the Americans rushed to give their gold to Uncle Sam and to take the paper, the paper, at $20 an ounce. And then, of course, the sensible ones, the ones who knew the scam that was coming along, they didn't give Uncle Sam their gold. No. They changed all the paper that they had for gold. <laughs> and then they shipped the gold to Switzerland. Outside of Uncle Sam's reach. Because they knew what's going to come in. And this is why today, you see all around the United States, people wanted to buy gold. Buy gold. Because they know what's coming. In January of 1934, the U.S. government, at the behest of the Federal Reserve, now re-monetizes gold. It cancels the legislation. You can now come back and buy back your gold from Uncle Sam. But Uncle Sam changed the value of his paper. His paper was $20 to one ounce of gold. And Uncle Sam decided from this day it will now be 35. 35. I'm telling you this story so you could understand what Allah is saying in the Quran when he said, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ And he said it, three times in the Quran. So we rushed to buy back our gold from Uncle Sam. And we paid him $35 an ounce. After the American people had bought back their gold, Uncle Sam was left with 41% of the wealth of the country in his pocket. by the simple expedient of devaluing the money by the simple expedient of devaluing the paper the American government ripped off the American people to the tune of 41% of their wealth you did not have gold. 
And so Richard Nixon went to Camp David and then on Sunday announced to the world, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it. <laughs> and he tore up Bretton Woods. That's what he repudiated a treaty obligation, just repudiated it. And the very foundation of international law, on the basis of which we can have an ordered world, is pacta sunt servanda. Pacta sunt servanda. The treaty obligations must be honored. Pacta sunt servanda. Treaty obligations must be honored. Surat al-Ma'idah begins with that same statement. At the very beginning of Surat al-Ma'idah, when you give your word, you must keep your word. And if you cannot, then seek forgiveness from Allah, give charity, free a slave, fast, and make tawbah, repent for it. But no, he said, we gave our word, we don't have to keep it. And he tore it up. So since September 1971, no paper money in the world, none, is redeemable in gold on the basis of law. It's just paper. By 1973, when the war took place between Israel and the Arabs, the US dollar had collapsed to 160 from 35. 160. By January 1980, when the, uh, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the US dollar collapsed to 850 to one ounce of gold. And as we speak now, you can go on the internet and check. I'm sure it's somewhere around 1,000 now, now as I speak. Above 1,000, above, it just cross up 1,000. What happens when the value of money falls? The answer was provided in 1931 with that test shot. If you did not understand it, what happened in 1931 should make it clear that when the value of this money falls, people are ripped off. There's a massive transfer of wealth from the unsus unsuspecting masses to that predatory elite. This is the biggest ripoff that mankind has ever had the misfortune to experience from the time that Adam alayhi salam set foot on earth to this day. And you don't need a degree in economics to understand it. I have just explained it to you so simply. It is so easy to understand. I didn't even have to use any sophisticated, complicated language. Even a farmer could understand what I have just explained. This is riba. And they have used this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram monetary system as a vehicle for riba. And they have ripped off mankind and the ripoff is complete. It's finished. They have already impoverished the masses around the world. And they have already transferred that wealth to the elite around the world, who now live in unprecedented wealth and luxury in Egypt, in Indonesia. You should see them in their five-star restaurants having dinner, with, of course, so many security guards outside because they're scared of the poor. The ripoff is complete. 
Shore River. And they are now set to rule the world. But this is not the end of the story. <laughs> Tomorrow they would not need the paper money anymore. When Israel takes over from the United States as a new ruling state in the world, the US dollar will have to give way as the international currency. So I ask myself, which currency is going to take over? Is it the Israeli shekel? And while all the money in the world is going down in value, Israel's money is not. And then I realized, no. They're not going to remain with this bogus and fraudulent monetary system of paper currencies because they have something better than that in store for you. At least with the paper currency, you could take it home and give it to your wife and tell her, put it away. At least with the paper currency, you could keep it at home. Nobody knows how much money you have. At least with the paper currency, you can give it in charity and nobody would know how much you gave and who you gave it to. They don't want you to do that. They don't want you to be able to conceal from them how much you have. They don't want you to be able to give even one cent to anybody. And they don't know about it. Well, how are they going to do that? Are, going, are they going to appoint police in every home? They don't need to do that. All that they have to do is to trigger a 2012, I believe it's called, <laughs> to trigger a monstrous, a massive catastrophe in the world which will bring down the whole thing. The US dollar crashes and it'll bring down with it all the paper money in the world. And if you're caught with the paper, you can use it as wallpaper. And they have something to replace it. It's money you can't feel, you can't touch. It's money you can't see. Who is going to accept money I can't see and money I can't touch? No, 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 no. They're going to say, well, we're bringing to the world progress. It's called a cashless economy. And that's supposed to be progress. A cashless economy. You can't pay with paper anymore. That's old fashioned. No, no, no. Now it's electronic money. Are they going to get away with it? Electric impulses? That is now money. Yesterday you took a piece of paper, you printed a picture on it, you put a number on it, and you assigned an entirely fictitious value to it. And you made wealth out of nothing. That's shirk. But all the cattle in the world accepted it and were using it. And in the process of accepting your paper and using your paper, they were themselves transferring their wealth to you. <laughs> you have to hand it to Dajjal, he's real smart. But now they don't need that anymore. Electronic impulses will now become money. Governments will no longer be able to issue money. No banking system around the world and a computer keyboard and they will control the banking system and so all the money in the money system of the world will be in the banking system and so they will know how much money you have you can't hide it and they will know how you're using your money they will know when you bought and how much you bought and how much you paid. Every single thing is recorded. And when you give money to the masjid, 
they will know who you are. When you give money in charity, they know who you are. And if you're so stupid as to send any money at all to Palestine, they're going to send you to Guantanamo. So what we have in store for us tomorrow is the equivalent of a financial Guantanamo. It's not just anymore ripper, riba being used to rip you off. It is more than that. That the new monetary system is meant to not only rip you off, but also to enslave you, to rob you of your freedom. This is the Jal's most dangerous weapon. And he's already used the weapon. What do we do? How do we respond? Tomorrow, we're going down to Cedrus. We say it is not possible to respond with a macro response. No. We don't have the power for that. We say only a micro response is possible. And that micro response is a remotely located Muslim village in which we will bring back the Sunnah money. Gold and silver. And if you do not allow us to use gold and silver, then we will use commodities of food consumption in abundant supply in the market. What's the criteria that separates them from all the other states? Okay. Check one. The comment was made, this is the question, the comment was made in the previous session that the holy state of Israel created by Nabi Dawood alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam was the greatest state that mankind would ever experience. How did you come to that conclusion? Where is the evidence? And what is the measuring rod which was used? The answer is in the Quran that it was Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam who made a dua to Allah to grant that this state of Israel, the holy state of Israel, would be the grandest and greatest state in the world in all of history. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that dua. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that one night he had a wrestling match with shaitan, with Iblis. And he defeated him. And he overpowered him. And he said, I was going to tie him up to the pillars of the masjid. And when the people came to the masjid for fajr, they would see shaitan tied up against the pillar of the masjid. But then I remembered the dua of Suleiman alayhi salam. And I had to release him. Hmm? This is the only answer we can give to you from the Quran and from the Hadith. What is clear about the Holy State of Israel, established by Nabi Dawood and Nabi Suleiman, is that it recognized Allah's sovereignty. It enforced Allah's law and power in that state. Power was used against the oppressor and to protect and to liberate the oppressed. Power was used to advance truth and to oppose falsehood as in the case of the Queen of Saba. Uh, next question. Yes, come forward quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, Sheikh, my question is, um, one thing I'm trying to have trouble putting my head, um, getting my head around is that when they started printing off more notes than the amount of gold they had, 
What I don't understand is if, say, all of us, for example, have our paper money and we, they have our gold, right? So is it that we think that because our gold safe, we just keep trading with paper? I, I just still have trouble understanding you know, why is it, uh, how is it at a loss? You know, uh, do you get me? How do I explain it? Um, If I understand the question, and I'm having a difficulty in understanding, why did the people exchange their gold for paper? Why did they benefit from printing, minting gold coins? Oh, okay, okay. You begin you begin the process, you begin the process by printing only that amount of paper which can be redeemed for the gold that you have. The goldsmith began the scam. He said, keep your gold with me, I'll keep it and I'll give you a receipt. And so when he got a hundred ounces of gold, he issued a hundred receipts. And people began to use the receipts now, like a check, to exchange with one another, knowing that anybody could go to the goldsmith and cash the check. So the paper currency functioned as a check that you can cash. The only problem was that the goldsmith, instead of issuing a hundred checks for a hundred ounces of gold, began to create wealth out of nothing. He issued two hundred checks for one hundred ounces of gold. Nobody knows about it, of course. Today, everybody knows about it. Today they call it fractional reserve banking. But at that time it was secret. When people got to know that he has issued more paper than he has the gold, they became scared and there's a rush now to get back my gold. And as they rush on the goldsmith to get back the gold, he doesn't have enough gold. So some people are left with only worthless paper in their hands. That's the scam. Next one, Ophais. Just a comment on that. There's a, there's a, this is not only question and answer, there's also comments, huh? There's a comment on that, just to wrap wrap our heads because some I've, I've encountered this issue before I'm the goldsmith and I partner you in on this I print more receipts than there are gold I get you to go buy land for me I get you I get you to go buy someone else's land for me I get you to go buy some oranges for me I get you to go buy some jewelry for me and we dump that fraudulent money into the system you see and when that money goes bad we're left with real wealth which people are left with paper. That's, this is what bankers do. They have agents that, that increase the money supply, buy real goods with it, and then when that money supply comes circulating into the economy, it dilutes our money supply, which reduces our purchasing power. So, so the issue is, people think inflation has to do with laws of supply and demand, but what is provable is that inflation, 99% of inflation, has to do with manipulation of the money supply, just printing more money through, through various ways. They call it inflation. Yeah, it's... Actually, it is what the Quran has prohibited. Go ahead and face. Your question is, where's the gold? That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, that's, that's not in Fort Knox, actually. If you think that gold is still sitting in Fort Knox, I'm not positive it's still in Fort Knox. It used to be in Fort Knox. Um, but it's very important to understand now, the, the second thing about what Molana said, 
they will demonstrate to you how even this catastrophic performance of the dollar to an ounce of gold is is blunted by forces that 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 are are, are trying to keep the dollar up. So, uh, my question to you, Sheikh Iman, is why do you think that this issue? falls on deaf ears. Is it because people think it has to do with money and they're like, I don't want to be greedy, it's economics. Uh, and, and when you put it in plain language, saying that people are stealing, forget it, if you don't care if people are stealing from you, they're stealing from your kids. They're stealing mm. from your kids, these, mm. the elite. So I'm curious why you think people don't respond to this issue. Why, despite the fact that this subject is so critically important, why is it that people not just don't have an interest in it, more than that, they don't want to hear about it? Answer, it is the psychology of intimidation. CNN is involved. The newspapers are involved, the radio and television. The governments are involved, a process of psychological intimidation that if you do this, we're going to come after you. And they have the power. And I don't want to lose my business. No. My business is more important to me than the law. I don't want to lose my freedom to travel. My U.S. visa is more important to me than the law. So we're being tested. And we fail the test. And we pay the price for it. Wait a minute, before we have the next question. Sister Salma is at the back, from Idaho. And Salma has been writing to me. Salma, who converted to Islam recently, she wanted to start a project of the gold dinar in Idaho. Yes. The sister sitting at the back there. And the rest of us, the rest of us are sleeping soundly at, at night time, not bothered at all. And a convert to Islam just a few years ago is writing to me. See, the child at work. He's very angry. Very angry. Yeah, Sister Selma, would you like to speak on, on the gold dinar? Just take the, take the microphone for her. Oh, I come forward, yeah. Honestly, I don't really know anything about economics, and it's really hard for me to try to grasp what's going on. I've been trying really hard, watching a lot of videos, reading what you've written, and I just felt it was time to try to break out of the system and create our own even if you had to start on a very small scale. And so I found a company that mints gold and silver coins and you could start for a certain amount of money. And I thought, well, maybe I could get some people around me. Even though I don't live with any Muslims, I live in a community that's rather independent minded. And I thought maybe they would be interested in starting just a local economy based on gold and silver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody, somebody sent me an email about a non-Muslim in the United States who began trading in gold, using gold as money, and the FBI came in and seized all the gold. Somebody sent me that information, yeah. Yeah, and they seized all the gold. The FBI came in and moved in and seized all the gold. Yes, uh, Farhan. Um, just one comment and, and, a, and a question real quick. Um, kind of related to what Dr. Fai said. Um, diamonds are, we know how precious diamonds are and, and um, we, know, we know the value of, of diamonds. They are, uh, they are the most abundantly found mineral or rock on diamonds. Are, diamonds are the most abundantly think about it the most abundantly in, in, in Africa I mean the gold mines we know about in, in South Africa and Africa uh, De Beers owns uh, those mines 
uh, they, they ripped off the African people whom the, the diamonds really belong to. And they let a very, very minuscule, minute amount of diamonds in the market so as to keep the price of diamonds up to where they are. So, you know, diamonds, you know, kind of related to, you know, what, what the gold, what, what the, what the uh, artificial pricing of the gold. So the, the Diamonds also qualify as a precious stone, not a precious metal. But can diamonds be used as money? I think even though I'm not an expert on diamonds, I think that the complications that will arise in assessing a diamond, whether it's a real diamond or a fake diamond, and assigning a value to the diamond makes it, makes it impossible to use diamonds as money. Yeah. And, and the question I had was, um, so US dollars or any currency that we exchange for another, so when we do that, of course, some of the value is lost because or, or, or gained, whichever one. So isn't that ripped? So, I mean, we're committing sin, right? So how do we, we can't get away from that with, with this current, the way that, I mean, things are. So, I mean, I had to convert my dollars into, you know, uh, TT dollars, right? So I'm, I'm exchanging money for money. It's just the same thing as exchanging, like, dates to dates. Mm. So, so. Okay. If you have any U.S. dollars to change to TT dollars, just go to the desk out there. The banks are changing at six, but we're not a bank. <laughs> so I would like to see that we give you a higher rate than the bank. Hmm? So go to the counter there and we'll try to get you a higher rate than the bank. But I have to use the paper currency. I can't get away from it. I'm selling my books. I can't sell the books for dinars and dirhams. This is the meaning of the hadith, that the time will come when you will not be able to find a single person in all of mankind who will not be consuming riba. And if anyone claims that he is not consuming riba, Verily, the dust of riba would be upon him. Verily, the vapor of riba be upon him. This is a very gloomy picture. But Surah Al-Taghabun of the Quran comes with a ray of hope for us. In Surah Al-Taghabun, Allah says, Ittaqullaha mastata'atum Fear Allah to the extent that you have capacity to do so. And what lies beyond your capacity, the surah offers a ray of hope that you would not have to account for what is beyond your capacity. What is within our capacity is to offer a micro response, a micro response to this monetary crisis. And that micro response is to move to the remote countryside and to establish a micro market. And in that micro market, strive to bring back the Sunnah money. Yes. Sheikh, uh, I have uh, kind of two questions. Uh, first one is, as far as Islamic banking, most of us in the UK try and move, go, move the post all the time, trying to find a halal way of doing things. And uh, obviously, you've had the evolution of Islamic banking. You said before it's backdoor riba. I just wanted to know: is it, um, do you suffer the same sins of the 36 that you outlined before for to, for taking that riba, or if you were to, if you were to have what they call a halal mortgage? Um, that was and just want an answer for that, really. Okay, this is light from Britain. Uh, if I am understanding the question correctly, number one, what do you do with riba money? If you have riba money? No? No. Okay. And number two, the, the Islamic banking system, which offers an alternative 
to the commercial river. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. The Islamic banking system offers a number of different transactions, some of which are halal. But that's just the icing on the cake, so to say, the dust. The, the bulk of the transactions of Islamic banking, the bulk, that brings in the bulk of the revenue, is murabaha. That's it. And a murabaha transaction operates like this. That I buy something and I sell it to you at a profit. And both the buyer and the seller are aware of the profit. And both the buyer and seller are in agreement on the transaction. Murabaha. But what the Islamic bank is doing is not murabaha. Although they say it's murabaha. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam would sometime buy on credit. Because he didn't have the money to pay. And so a credit transaction is halal. However, you do not have even a fig leaf of information, of evidence, that the shopkeeper in a credit transaction was allowed to increase his price because he had to wait for his cash, his payment. No. If I can raise my price because I have to wait for you to pay me, then money can increase over time. That's all, nothing else, only time. And the increase of money over time is riba. And so in Islam, it is as plain and as clear as daylight that credit price and cash price was always the same. There was no increase in credit price over cash price. No. And so yes, a credit transaction is halal on the condition that there is no increase in price because it's a credit transaction. What the Islamic banks are doing is they're selling on credit at a price higher than the cash price. The difference between the two is riba. When we tell the muftis, and there's so many of them now, that this is riba, they dismiss us. We feel sad because these are our brothers. And in their hearts, there is sincerity. And these are learned people. But you warn them, and you warn them, and you warn them, and they don't listen to you. What can you do? Yes. Therefore, so those who have riba debt, and they do want to uh, migrate to the, to the Muslim village, can they leave with, with, with debt lingering, or do they have to clear it up first before they go? If you borrowed money, then you are supposed to return the principal sum. Falakum ru'usu amwalikum. You can't just turn your back and walk out. No. Pakistan cannot say, well, I borrowed all of this money from you, but I'm not going to pay back. Bangladesh cannot say that because Allah says about the money lender, Falakum ru'usu amwalikum. I pointed this matter to Dr. Isra Ahmad in Pakistan and he agreed with me. That you are entitled to the return of your principal sum. What you can do, وَإِن كَانَ ذُو عُسْرَ فَنَزِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٌ 
if the debtor is having difficulty in repaying the principal sum, Bolivia had that problem, Peru had that problem in South America, then you can declare, I do not have the means to pay you more than this amount every year. In the Bible, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous sharia, which came to Musa alayhi salam, he had fixed a limit for debt. That no debt would continue for a period longer than seven years. The IMF and the World Bank don't want to hear about that. <laughs> no banking system in the world wants to hear that. But at the end of every seven years, all debts were wiped out. Were in Kana Zu Usra, Fanaziratun Ila Maisara, Wanta Saddaku Khairul Lakum in Kuntum Ta'alamun. So you wipe out the debt after a certain period of time when you realize that the debtor is not capable of repaying you. But you still have to honor your obligation to repay and you have to make the effort to repay the principal sum not the interest yes any other questions the sister karima oh, oh okay muhammad well no, i just had some some comments adding on to some of the things i think that um it's difficult sometimes to take a, a sort of absolutionist approach to the whole thing um, once, once people sort of uh, first realize or once they learn about the topic. Um, what I wanted to ask you is that would it be possible um, or what would be the validity of applying that step-by-step -step process in one's personal sort of situation uh, to remove oneself from, from riba? So then we could equate the, the, the educational process to that personal realization process. Hey, you know, I'm in this situation. I need to do something about it. Um, and then following up from that, you know, um, there's a process of, of, of where there was no new riba allowed. And in your personal capacity in your life, with regards to your debt you may have, make tawbah for it and don't take on any new debt. Um, and then following on from that, you know, service it, get sorted out, cut up the credit cards, you know, get rid of it. Um, and then you get to the final stage, which is actually now no more debt, you know, whether old or new. Um, and that is actually the, the, at that point, you've actually extricated yourself from, from, from the system. And that is applying, you know, that methodology of, of a stage-by-stage -stage process. Because I've met many people that once they realize this, they want to leave their homes and leave their cars and leave everything, you know. And some of them, you know, have put themselves into great difficulty and caused even bigger problems. Yeah? Mm. So, um, Wait, Muhammad, yeah. I have a suggestion. We have here in this gathering my students who've been listening to me, including him. And where is Hasbullah? My students who've been listening to me for, for many years now, and they know the subject quite well. So what I'd like you to do is questions that I don't have to answer because they can answer the questions, okay? That you should now have your discussion sessions, every spare moment that you have. You have your discussion sessions, except when you're too sleepy and you have to sleep. Hmm? Uh, because we're running out of time, we have only five more minutes for this session. Uh, and when you have a problem connected with riba that even my students cannot answer, then you bring it to me, inshallah. Okay, but if you bring me a question I know they can answer, and they didn't answer it, I want to know why they did not answer it. Hmm? So let us now try to bring this session to a close. Yes, allow the two sisters. The two sisters, yeah. Sister Karima. I just wanted to say on the behalf of... A little louder, of... please. Yeah. Okay, we have on the behalf of the women that did come to the retreat. Um, prior to the retreat starting, I've had many emails that I received from brothers that visit your website, that visit Wake Up Project, and they sent their prayers and their dua. But they would tell me at the end, 
we can't make it due to security uh, uh, risk or due to uh, possibly FBI, CIA. And I see all these women that have sacrificed whatever they had to sacrifice to be here because they do want answers. And because many of the men are not standing up, that I commend them for making the effort to be here, not being afraid of whether the television is there or whether the cameras are there. And I would just like to hear what you have to say to the women that are making this sacrifice and feel like we're alone. We have no men except for you. Mm. Yeah, we have Sister Samia here from, from Ghana. Her husband gave her permission. She traveled all the way from Ghana to come here. And we, we have been time and again recognizing in this retreat, we, mention, we don't mention the name of the men. We mention the name of the women who've been working for this retreat. There's Joyce at the back somewhere, who's been working very hard for this retreat, and may Allah bless her for it. Um, there's another sister who would like to speak, yes? This is not Atia. No. All right. Oh, Sundri yeah. from Trinidad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I have two questions, Maulana, two small questions. I wanted to know if I am to understand that as long as investments con has risk in it, if it is not considered riba, as long as there is some measure of risk. And the other question is, at the time of the Dajjal, would the true Muslims be able to recognize him and safeguard themselves? Because I am quite worried if, if, you know, if it is otherwise. All right. Thanks. If the Jal is released, and the Jal is at work in the world today, and it is the Jal which is explaining what is happening in politics, and what is happening in economics and what is happening in monetary economics. If the Jal is the explanation and you cannot recognize the Jal, the Kafir, you don't have faith. You don't have faith. Because the Hadith is that every believer will be able to read Kafir on his forehead whether he is katib or ghayru katib. The second question was pertaining to resment, investment, risk investment. A risk-free investment is a haram investment because it does not qualify as business. To qualify as business, it has to embrace risk. Once it does not embrace risk, and it is a risk-free investment, it is not business. It is therefore haram. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.